I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May if you come forward for the offering. We thank you for this day that you've given us. We pray that we give with cheer cheerful spirits and, and glad hearts for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. sovereign king of this universe. Or as we look at different things that happen in our nation, we know that you can be glory in very difficult circumstances. And we pray that that's the case. We pray that we are faithful to sing your praises in difficult times. Lord, we don't know what the future holds for this nation. We, we don't know what the future holds for this state, this city. You do, and we're thankful for that. We just pray that we would stand strong in faith, and we would encourage godly behavior amongst the people of this church, amongst believers in this county and state and nation. Regardless of how things are going, you have called us to be set apart unto you. And we, we acknowledge that and pray you give us the courage to do that. Much like today as we read in the Sunday School lesson, a young 15, 16, 17 year old boy that, that said that the battle was yours as he was facing that giant Goliath. 
As the men of Israel turned and ran away from Goliath, David ran toward that giant as king. Lord, give us that courage. Give us that faith that David had. Lord, we pray today for our president. We pray for our vice president. I don't know about their salvation. Uh, you know that. I pray that if they're not believers, that you put somebody in their path that would share the word of God with them and draw them to your son, Jesus. But we pray for the Congress. We pray for our governor here in the state and governors around the country. Again, we pray that they don't know you, that you would draw them to yourself and save them. Let us be faithful to pray for our leaders and to pray for their salvation. We pray that you would put people around them that would remind them of your goodness and your righteousness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's 
pillar changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave away, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, and they did not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belzar was greatly alarmed, his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. So we're continuing in Daniel this morning, where that's where our journey continues today, but we need a little background, just, uh, <clears throat> just so you'll know what happened, and you may not know uh, that when we, when we look in Daniel in the fifth chapter, that there's such a time lapse between chapter four and chapter five. There's significant time lapse, actually. Um, at this point, Nebuchadnezzar has been dead about 25 years. So he's, he has died, and since Daniel doesn't record anything that happens there, we need to have some idea of what happened. Nebuchadnezzar, when he died, um, the Babylonian Empire began to decline pretty quickly after that. His son, Amel Marduk, yes, that was his name, reigned for about two years and was assassinated shortly thereafter. And I meant to say children's church, if that's the one that the kids can go, I'm sorry. Um, so Amel Marduk died after a couple of years. The Bible even mentions him in 2 Kings 25 and Jeremiah 52, although it names him with a different name, Ebel uh, Merodach. Names, names, names. Um, after he was assassinated by his own brother-in-law, it was rough. It was rough in that time. I mean, so his own brother-in-law assassinated him. His name was Nerigosar, and this guy took the throne. And so he lives, he, he reigns for about four years. And the scripture also names him. But he's replaced by his son after he is killed, Labashi Marduk. This, this person was only a child and ruled for nine months and was killed. A group of people had decided that they wanted to take the kingdom away from this from Nebuchadnezzar's family. And so when they killed this last child who, who reigned for only those months, somebody had to step in and be on the throne. And a guy named Nabonidus did that. This is all in history. I mean, the scripture records it perfectly in line with historians. Nebuchadnezzar ruled the throne for about 17 years, and he was king over the whole area of Babylonia. And that's important to know. In the process of him marrying either Nebuchadnezzar's wife or daughter, one of his daughters, we don't know. History doesn't record that piece. History does record that this woman had a son named Belshazzar whom Amy read about just a moment ago. And so while, uh, while we have <clears throat> Nabonidus ruling the kingdom, Belshazzar, he ruled Babylonia, the city itself. Now, it was also about this time that King Cyrus of the Medes and the Persians began to just devastate countries all around and he begins a pursuit of Nabonidus and winds up capturing Nabonidus. Eventually, they surround Babylonia, Babylon. They surround the temple. They surround the city. And it's a massive city, but they have completely cut the city off. And so what's important to know is that um, they had been laying siege to Babylon. Some historians say months. Others say years they surrounded the city. So they were surviving because of, of the gates. You remember we talked about the, how tall the wall was and how thick that wall was. 
we're talking we're talking multiple feet thick and tall enough that they could not have scaled the walls. And while the walls were so wide, remember I told you that chariots would go on the top and turn around and go up and down the walls. So, so it's a massive city. A massive city. And they're surrounded by the Medes and the Persians. And it was at this moment that Belshazzar had an opportunity to show real leadership to his people. So what does he do? How does the king deal with the stressors of life? He did what a lot of people do today to deal with the stressors of life. He throws a party. He throws a party. Now, this is not a party that I'm thinking that anybody in here would really want to go to, to be honest with you, because it was alcohol fueled from the get-go. He, he fed, you see the, we'll get to the actual feast here in just a minute, but when you think about it, King Nebuchadnezzar built an empire, massive, and ruled it for decades. His grandson, Belshazzar, threw a party. And that's what he's known for. And Belshazzar's arrogance is going to play out in our passage today. You know, Belshazzar had probably been doing these kinds of things while he was ruling Babylonia before, and he had not had any consequences that had hit him as a result of that. That brings us to think about Daniel just for a minute. Do you think Daniel got tired? Did he ever get tired of serving these God haters? I do. And yet, he remained faithful to the one true king without faltering. He's probably about 80 at this time. And you remember, under Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, he ruled and ruled well in that time. So Daniel's about 80. If anybody had a right to go to a party because they were disappointed and discouraged, it would have been Daniel. But he didn't do that. Eventually, they had to call for Daniel to come, and it tells you he wanted nothing to do with this. Even at this point, when Daniel was 80 years old, they still described him as a man in whom the spirit of the holy gods resides. You know, we, we've got to remember this. There are sometimes there are no immediate consequences for our actions. And it's true, isn't it? I mean, if we, if we think that we can um, not exercise and just lay around and our hearts will continue to be good and there are no consequences, that eventually there's going to be a consequence to us not moving around. Amen? There is. Our hearts are, something's going to happen. Our lungs, our hearts, something is going to happen. But we don't know that right at that moment. There's no consequence, at least at that particular time. You can tell my voice is hard to start, start to go a little bit. Um, but how do you handle having the freedom from immediate consequences reveals the depth of your commitment to Jesus Christ? Folks, if we think that we can sin and there not be an immediate consequence, and continue to do that and do that and do that, understand that for you and for me, the handwriting is on the wall. It's there. We may not see it, but the handwriting is on the wall. And we'll, we'll see that handwriting here in just a minute. But let me ask you a question as we start off. Just like it's been for weeks, there are two contrasting personalities in our passage today. There's Belshazzar, who has this personality of throwing parties and ignoring Jehovah and ignoring Daniel, ignoring the three Hebrew friends. Or you've got Daniel, who remained faithful in a godless country. Which one are you going to be? I can tell you what the culture wants. The culture wants us to not make any waves, to, to not say anything about Jesus Christ wherever we are. 
they, they would say it's fine to do this on Sunday mornings between 11 and 12 o'clock or any other time of the week here, but, but don't you dare mention Jesus at work or at school or at Walmart or wherever it might be. Which one will you be? And please know <coughs> that you're either walking in the Spirit of God and growing in Him, or you are growing harder and away from Him. Those are the only two possibilities. <coughs> I'm sorry. I knew that was going to happen. But those are the only two options that we have today. And you might say, well, you know what? That's just not true, Brother Mike. Y yes, it is. It is. If you're content to not open your Bibles during the week and not to pray and not to share your faith, you are growing away from God. Amen? That was, that, that was very hard. I mean, folks, we, of all people, looking at, looking at what's coming from an economic perspective, understanding the political ramifications from having this administration in office, and just living in this godless age, we, of all people, ought to be hopeful, not because of what's going on around us, but because who is the king of the universe who has redeemed us, Amen. That's why we ought to have hope. But let's look at these three things, or four things. The king's feast. So Belshazzar throws this feast, and he's got a thousand of his lords with him, which means that there are other people there as well. I don't know how many people were there. You can read historical accounts of kings throwing parties and actually feeding ten to 15,000 people at every meal every day in their kingdoms. That's a lot of food. What do you think, Margie? You think you can handle that? I mean, that, that's a ton of food there. I don't know if it, I don't, that's just crazy, but they did that. It wasn't unusual for them to throw a feast. But you know what was unusual? It was unusual. He threw a feast when the enemy had surrounded his city. Something's wrong. Notice next that this thing turned into a drinking party. And you can see that in verse 1, actually. It says, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Kings didn't normally do that. Normally, when a king would be at a feast, there would be some kind of cover over him and the royal family. And they would, they would drink behind this curtain or something like that so people couldn't see them do that. He was out in front just making a show out of it and it reaches a point where they've been drinking long enough and we see in this, in verse 2 that Belshazzar, he tastes the wine. One translation says, when the wine began to taste good. <coughs> what one translation says, in the, in, and so he gives orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple and, with, and which was in Jerusalem <clears throat> so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and concubines might drink from them. This was a calculated insult to the one true God. He knew exactly what he was doing. More than likely, these vessels had not been moved out of the spot that Nebuchadnezzar had placed them in for safekeeping. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar, back in the first chapter, tells us that when he destroyed Jerusalem, he went to the temple and took those vessels and took them back to Babylon and, and basically put them in storage. And so we have Belshazzar basically mocking Jehovah here as he does this. And there's another unusual point. It says that his wives and concubines might drink from it. Women never attended these events. So this was a this was a very depraved environment that was taking place that night in Babylon that the king was doing. So they bring these these vessels out and they drink the wine they drink the wine, it says, and praise the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, 
and stone. Secondly, the king's folly. If you have your Bibles open, look over in verse 22. Strategic verse in all of I think this is a strategic verse for us, but it's a strategic verse in chapter 5. He says, yet you, his son, this is Daniel speaking to the king, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. Eventually, Daniel comes to this party. He is summoned to come. And as he comes, he takes a moment to recall some of the history that had taken place between King Nebuchadnezzar and King Belshazzar. And Daniel, can't, Daniel tells King Belshazzar that he can't claim the excuse. Well, I didn't know that because Jehovah had given him multiple times to know was was it what was happening. So is it possible that he couldn't have known about Nebuchadnezzar? No. It was not possible. He had heard those stories, but what happened was Belshazzar didn't learn. He knew how God had humbled his grandfather, but didn't humble his heart, and he exalted himself against heaven. Let me ask you a question this morning. What are some things that you have heard but you haven't learned. King Belshazzar failed because he didn't learn to apply those things that he had heard about Jehovah's dealings with Nebuchadnezzar. And look, God has given every single person in here, people in our past, that have attempted to teach us things that maybe we have heard, but what? We never learned. We never learned. Men and women who've gone before us. Is there anything, is there anything that the Lord God would say to you today that you have heard but, but you haven't learned? Maybe you grew up in a, in a godly home. Maybe you're a second or third generation Christian in your home, but you're not taking your relationship with Jesus as seriously as you should. Where did that wind up with? King Belshazzar. Well, notice in verse 5, immediately, my translation says suddenly. Some translations say immediately. The fingers of a human hand appeared. We can all benefit from this story of King Belshazzar and the handwriting on the wall. Because if you don't recognize the handwriting on the wall for him, there's coming a day when that handwriting on the wall, and you've heard that phrase before, is going to be there for you and for me. Now, I don't know what that handwriting on the wall is for you, but it could very well be something that you've heard from Brother, from, from, I just, Brother Burton, I just had a brain for you. Can I believe that? I had to look at this baby and I knew it would be coming. That's terrible. Maybe all the drugs I'm on. I don't know. Uh, that's what we're going to blame it on. Um, but maybe it's maybe the handwriting law for you is something that Brother Burton preached. That you heard him say, but you never learned it and you never applied it. I don't know. But do understand this, that the kind of church family that we will be 10 years from now is impacted greatly by whether we, right now, act on what we have learned as a church. You do understand that, right? If we're looking ahead at what we're going to become, are we learning what the Word of God is teaching us today? What would the message of, Emer of Jesus be to Emory today? Would he say to us, like he said to King Belshazzar, you didn't do what I called you to do, even though you knew all this. Can I tell you, that verse frightens me. And it should frighten you. Because I know the kind of preacher that was here for 50 years. And he opened the word of God to you week after week, year after year, decade after decade. 
I know what I have attempted to do since I've been here, opening the Word of God year after year. And when I read the, those verses, I begin to shake, thinking that God in heaven is watching. So what, what is it then? To avoid hearing Jesus say, even though you knew all of this, we've got to be concerned about a number of things, but at least two things. One is personal holiness. Growing in Christ, being fully devoted followers, and that requires a, a, a steadfast belief that the Word of God is sufficient for every need that I have. Now, if I believe that, then I'm going to be in that Word. Sunday school is important for that. Explorers is vital for that as well. Personal holiness as well requires working on our progressive sanctification, growing deeply in Him, serving one another, even if it means confronting somebody over their sin. And the second thing that we've got to be concerned about, personal holiness, is evangelism. We cannot be fully devoted followers of Jesus if we're not interested in telling our neighbors, in telling our friends, in telling strangers about what it is that we believe. Because look, if I can talk to a friend about Ole Miss football, but I can't talk to him about Jesus, I don't really love that guy. I don't. I don't care that there's one day that he will go to hell without Jesus. Sure, I've talked to him about, uh, you know, Lane Kiffin's latest tweet, but will I tell him about what Jesus said to his disciples? Personal holiness and evangelism. Have you noticed the number of houses that are being built in the Watson area? We have an opportunity to share the gospel with people as they move in this place. And, and you might say, look, and, and I'm going to tell you this, you cannot say, I didn't know it was my responsibility to love them enough to check on their souls, even though you knew all this. You can't do that. I'm going to tell you right now, if you look at me and say, Brother Mike, it's not my responsibility to share the gospel. That's a lie. It is your responsibility. And it's mine as well. Well, look at the king's finale. The king's finale. The king held his feast and he maintained this folly. But the finale involves a humble servant, Daniel. So after the fingers of this human hand come and they write the words there on the wall, the scripture says that that the king's color changed and his knees knocked together. It's a weird phrase. Now, there's a portion of the book of Daniel that's written in Aramaic. I, I've never known anything about Aramaic. I, you know, I've studied Hebrew, but Aramaic's really tough. So what I'm getting ready to tell you is what I've read from some, some folks who, who knew Aramaic very well. That phrase, knees knocked together, it's all, it has the idea there that his bowels were, uh, were tied in knots to the point where he almost fell over. So he calls his astrologers together to interpret the words, and the king even promised them great gifts, saying that they would be the, the third greatest ruler in Babylon. But they were all unsuccessful. And then the queen comes in, now, this could have been Nebuchadnezzar's wife. Could have been. But she comes in to King Belshazzar and reminds him about Daniel. And so he goes through this spell again and says, look, if you'll do this, I'm going to give you this and give you this and give you this. And one of the first things out of Daniel's mouth, keep your gifts for yourself. I love that. I love that he comes in and this king is trying to bribe him or whatever. And he even, he even looks at Daniel and says, aren't you one of the ones that we brought in captivity from Jerusalem? Trying to make sure Daniel understood his place. And, 
Daniel just looks at him and, and says that I don't want anything that you've got to give me. And so then he gives, he gives Belshazzar a short sermon about what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. And after he recounted what had happened that very evening, he interpreted the words. They knew the translation. They could translate the words that were written on the wall there. What they didn't know is what it meant. And so he tells him, God has numbered your days, bringing your kingdom to an end. Nay, 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 nay. Keiko means you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Upharsin or Perez, depending on the translation, your kingdom is divided amongst the Medes and the Persians. You see, King, King Belshazzar knew that he was getting away with something. He knew about his grandfather's experiences, but apparently he didn't think that Jehovah cared. <coughs> Excuse me, Arwa was, was just completely indifferent to Jehovah. You can look at what happened uh, in the historical record. These things are recorded in different historians about the fall of Babylon. Historians have validated Daniel and Jeremiah in these passages. Look, the people of Babylon felt that their city was in, impenetrable. The walls were so thick and high, and the gates were so strong and high that no one could ever, ever break into the city. And not only that, they had enough provisions that it could have lasted for years inside. What about water? They even had a stream of water that was flowing through the city that would give them an ample water supply and would always it would even carry out their garbage and stuff out the other side. They had that as well. So they believed that they were completely safe and that nothing, nothing could destroy them. And yet that water source is what Darius the Mede chose to invade the city. They diverted the water away from that place and the water got down to about knee level and that Persian army went through that place and that very night Belshazzar was killed. He was killed. He had no idea, no idea what hit him. Verse 30 even recounts that in chapter 5. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about age, age of 62. Can we talk about another feast just for one second as we close? There's going to be another feast. The great king's Feast. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he eventually repented and acknowledged Jehovah. It took him seven years living like an animal to do that. This morning, this morning, are you worshiping the gods of gold, silver, bronze? iron, wood, and stone. When you look at your property, you look at your house, you look at your possessions, do you see those as yours? Are you trying to make sure that you've got enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, and wood? <clears throat> Worshiping those gods will take you to Belshazzar's feast. You, and you can go there. But if you're worshiping those gods, those words, mene, mene, teko, ufarsin, they apply to you. Because look, folks, for every single one of us, there's coming a day when God will look at us and he'll judge us in whether we are lacking something or not. That night, Belshazzar was judged and he was found lacking. But this, this, this lacking perfection, this lacking Jesus, you may go to the feast here on this planet, but you will go to a place called hell if he looks
looks at you and finds you lacking. But can I tell you this other feast that you can attend is not because you're noble enough, not because you're good enough, not because you've done good works. Actually, this is what this is what amazes me. The Father's Son, the Lord Jesus, when he died on the cross, the Father measured Jesus and found him perfect. And he gave him the kingdom. You know, the price to attend the feast with the Son of God is for you and for me to repent of our sins and follow him. When God writes something down, it happens. So would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we come to you this morning. I'm sure everybody in here wants to be Daniel in this story. That's my prayer. But there may be people here who've been playing church, and if you were to judge them today, they would be found lacking. Lord, when we base our Christianity on a decision that took place 25 years ago, and we haven't done anything since then, we're in danger. If we can't look at the last few weeks of our lives and see an indication of the Spirit of God and a passion for the Word and a love for the lost and a love for the body of Christ, that's an issue. I pray today that your Spirit would quicken, your Spirit would draw people to yourself that we would see that there is a great feast that's coming. We have an opportunity to go there. The price of admission is repenting and putting our faith and trust in Jesus and Him only. And I pray that's where we can, even today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a verse of invitation. What? 329. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing one verse. If you need to come to the altar, <clears throat> you can do you can pray right there where you are and you can come down to the front.
the back of the, of the bulletin, we've got a number of things that are back there. We've got, we've got the uh, Zoomerang BBS. You, if you have neighbors or kids, you could use this bulletin as a way to, to talk to them and they can actually register by taking a picture of that QR code to take them directly to the registration page. Thanks to Jeff for doing that. There, there is. I've got some right there, um, <clears throat> and it's got it's got that same QR code on it as well. Uh, then we've got a revival calling it spiritual boot camp. You see the, the men that will be speaking during that, and um, we will have dinner on the grounds Sunday, and then Wednesday night we'll have uh, homely ice cream after that. Any other announcements? That uh... all right. Well, what? Would you stand with uh, me as we will pray and we'll be dismissed? <clears throat> Brother Joe, would you come down here and pray for us, please? Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, even though it's a Sunday, Sunday is the Lord's day, but every day is the Lord's day. Because we are your children and we believe in you. Uh, we, uh, a lot of times we sin against you, but you have loved us and blessed us all these years. And we, uh, you have blessed this nation, even though uh, it's not a perfect nation. But uh, we know that you have a certain purpose for this nation. We ask that you uh, bless our leaders and uh, open their eyes to what's going on in this country. You know what uh, what you have planned for us in this future, but we do not know. So we ask that you continue to bless us and protect us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.